From the fanatically loyalist Sisters of Battle, we go to just the fanatical. And in this video, we're going to be moving on from the nuns with guns to the crazy blood soaked berserkers with chain axes, chain glaives, and all other manner of murderous tools. And yes, in this episode, we are going to be looking at the World Eaters. Also, I just wanted to say the reason there has been a few top five videos in a row is because I'm actually on holiday as of this going live. So these videos are the ones that I can do a bit more easily in terms of pre-recording them and scheduling them. So don't worry, the old, more regular news style videos will be back as soon as I get home. But I just wanted to get a few videos up and ready for when I'm away. So there is at least some content going up. But in any case, as I said, today we are looking at the World Eaters. And as always, this is going to be five units from their admittedly a little thin index comparatively to some others, but five units that I think are really solid and well worth taking if you are building a World Eaters list to take two tournaments or more competitive games. And as ever, this isn't going to be from best to worst. It is just five units in the book that I think are pretty good and worth taking. So let's get started and right off the bat we jump into a unit that has got a solid little price drop in the latest field manual. Corn Berserkers are really really solid especially if you want to run a spammy MSU style list with loads of small units. Loads of these guys maybe even in rhinos just charging up the board and overwhelming your enemy with pure weight of bloodthirsty bodies. At 100 points for 5, so 20 points each, they have your typical toughness 4, 3 up save, 2 wound marine profile. They also have OC2 and a 6 inch move, so there is nothing out of the ordinary there. They are however compared to other marines really quite scary in combat. They each carry a chain blade which gives them 4 strength 5 minus 1 AP, 1 damage attacks, and then 1 in 5 of them can take an Eviscerator, which grants them a Power Fist style Strength 8, minus 2 AP, 2 damage attack as well. So they can be really quite punchy, and this is made even better for them by the fact that they can also get into combat quite quickly too. Blood Surge is their unit ability, and it means that when an enemy shoots at them, if one of their models is killed, you can roll a d6 and then you can move that many inches towards the nearest enemy unit. So even as you are moving up and getting shot by your opponent, you can turn that into your advantage and make yourself even more of a threat to your opponent by closing down that gap between you every time they kill off one of your models. On top of that, you can also use this ability to actually get into engagement range, which I think is really, really good. It means you can also not only get yourself in combat without having to risk failing a charge, but it means you can also potentially protect yourself because if you use this to get into engagement range, then of course any extra enemy firepower that was going to be coming your way can't shoot at you because you're not a valid target because you're in engagement range of an enemy. So this can be a great little tool for getting you into combat, but also potentially protecting you if you're against a very shooty heavy army. They can also take an Icon of Corn, which lets you re-roll one of your Blessings of Corn dice if the unit is in range of an objective that you control. Now, Blessings of Corn, this is your army rule, and it basically lets you roll eight dice and you take a selection of buffs. You can take up to two depending on what you roll. So for example, any doubles can give you two inches of movement or a six up feel no pain. A double five can give you lethal hits. A triple four can give you advance and charge. So they've got some really good useful abilities and buffs to give to your army. So being able to re-roll one of those dice means you can much more easily fish for some of the stronger buffs or some of the buffs that you really, really want, like advance and charge or sustained hits or lethal hits, whatever you really need you can much more easily kind of go for that and aim to get it. It is just in general a solid army rule, I think, but the fact that this works even better for the Berserkers and they interact with it so nicely just makes it even more powerful and makes the Berserkers even more worth bringing just for that extra reliability in getting what you are aiming for from the Blessings. The detachment rule for the World Eaters in their index, Relentless Rage, also ties in well with Berserkers. It gives you plus one strength and plus one attack on the charge, and so that is going to turn your basic Berserker into a five attack strength six monster, and it means that a 10-man squad can potentially be putting out 50 attacks, which is really quite scary. 
All in all, Berserkers do obviously still die like Marines, so they aren't super durable, but for 20 points a model, especially as I said earlier in an MSU style list, you can get a load of them up the board really quickly, and you can just flood the enemy battle lines with chain blades and bodies charging and bloodthirsty ready to kill before your opponent really knows what's hit them. Up next, we have a really solid HQ in the Lord Invocatus. He is only 140 points, getting a drop of 15 in the latest field manual. And for that, you get a brilliant 12 inch move with toughness six, eight wounds, a two up save, a four up invulnerable save, and on top of that, a six inch scout move. So he can potentially get 18 inches up the board turn one, and then still attempt to charge. So turn one charges, are very, very doable with this fella. His shooting is, as you'd expect, pretty meh. He just has a bolt pistol, but in melee, he really is quite scary. He's got seven strength six, minus two AP, two damage attacks with devastating wounds. And of course that becomes eight strength seven attacks on the charge, thanks to the detachment rule. So again, he combos really, really well with that. And then on top of those attacks, he has a further four attacks that hit on threes, and our strength six, minus one AP, two damage, with Lance for plus one to wound on the charge as well. So he can be chucking out just himself a solid 11 or 12 attacks, all of which will be really, really good at killing two wound marines. So he can blend through that kind of target incredibly well. He can also charge in a turn he falls back along with the unit he's joined, so it is going to be very, very hard to pin him down and just stop him getting into the exact combat he wants to be and get him exactly where he wants to be on the battlefield. And then on top of that, his key ability is the Road of Eight Bloody Steps. And this, in my opinion, is one of the best reasons for bringing him. This rule lets you choose two infantry units within six inches of him at the start of the battle before scout moves are made and then they also gain the scout's six inch ability. So he can buff up a unit of berserkers or a unit of exalted eight bound or just regular eight bound, all of whom he can also join as a leader, but then he can let them move up six inches alongside him. So of course, for a melee army like World Eaters, this is a huge buff. It essentially grants you an extra movement phase before the game begins and really can allow you to set up some semi-reliable turn one charges, especially in conjunction with things like the Unbridled Bloodlust Blessing, which lets you scout six inches and then move and advance thanks to the blessing and still declare a charge. So you can very, very easily get into melee with your opponent turn one, which will undoubtedly be a nasty shock for them if they weren't expecting that many chain blades and attacks to their favorite units so early in the game. The regular HQ on Juggernaut is also a very good pick as well. He's not in this list because I wanted to choose one or the other, but the regular guy is very, very good too. There are some great enhancements he can take, but just for that extra scout move on two extra units for a melee army like the World Eaters, I just think makes the Lord Imokatus so, so powerful and so, so useful just in terms of avoiding as much firepower as you can and getting into combat with as much of your force as you can, as quickly as you can. In the third spot for competitive units in this index, I was again torn between either the eight bound or the exalted eight bound. I think both have got a lot better recently and both are arguably worth taking. But personally, I just think the regular eight bound have a little bit more going for them. They have recently dropped 20 points, so they are down to 135 points for three now, which makes them 45 points per model. And for that, you get a speedy nine inch move, toughness six, three wounds, a three up armor save and a five up invun. So they are reasonably tanky. And of course they can get into combat quickly thanks to that nine inch move. This is made even easier for them because they also have a six inch scout move. And yes, this may feel a bit wasted if you look at the Lord Invocatus above that we just talked about, but I think even taking that into account and you know knowing that the Lord Invocatus might be able to buff them with it anyway, just looking at the data sheet on its own individual merits, scout six inches is a really, really strong rule to have. And again, with something like the advance and charge blessing, it means you can get a six inch scout, a nine inch move, and then on an average three or four inch advance, it means again, you can be 18 inches up the board turn one with these guys, fully capable 
of again threatening a turn one charge. They also get some really solid damage output in melee with a good choice of weapons. The eight bound eviscerators are their base weapons and that gets you six strength five minus two AP two damage attacks for chewing through things like marines whilst the champion of the unit has lacerators which are four strength nine minus two AP three damage attacks which will of course help you get through light vehicles and sort of more heavier elite units. If you are going into chaff or you know there's going to be a lot of chaff on the board the champion can instead take a heavy chain glaive and what this gives you is eight strength seven minus three one damage attacks so this is going to be really good if you are up against Astra Militarum and there's going to be a load of infantry squads or Tau with loads of fire warriors this will just melt through them like a hot knife through butter. And that isn't all because they get even better thanks to their Beacons of Rage rule which gives you reroll wound rolls of 1 and then full rerolls to wound if the enemy unit you're targeting is below half strength. So this is really good for them allowing them to get the most out of their damage output but even better this is actually an aura that affects all World Eater units within 6 inches. So it's a great solid powerful buff that is going to massively boost the damage output of not only your 8 bound but also anything like berserkers or jackals or terminators or even angron that may be near them. And talking of angron of course he is in this list he had to be pretty much. He is up next in fourth place and he is still as terrifying as ever. He is pricey he comes in at 415 points but that brings him along with his 14 inch move fly toughness 11, 16 wounds, 2 up save, 4 up in run as well as deep strike so he really can get your opponent and strike fear into them pretty much anywhere on the battlefield like nowhere is safe from him and he is still reasonably durable whilst he's doing it. He of course has his melee weapons of Samniarius and Spine Grinder, which net him either 8 strength 16 minus 4 AP d6 plus 2 damage swings or against hordes a whopping 18 strength 8 minus 2 AP 2 damage attacks meaning on the charge he can kill about 9 marines relatively easily wiping out almost an entire squad in one go and against things like imperial knights with the strike profile he will pretty reliably one shot them almost all the time he does on average about 25 wounds if not a little bit more into things like a knight profile. He also gets a solid choice of abilities each charge phase from his Wrathful Presence rule. He can give plus one to charge rolls within six inches thanks to Glorious Bloodletting which will help your army just get into combat even faster. Or he can give plus one attacks to melee weapons to units within six inches if the unit is below starting strength. And one model units like himself get this if they've lost at least one wound. So this can still buff things like your Hellbrutes or your Mauler Fiends not just your, your Berserkers or your Terminators and stuff like that. Or then finally he could also choose Righteous Slaughter which is another 6 inch aura. This one gives you rerolls to hit which is again super super solid on things like Berserkers and Berserkers in particular can end up getting full hit and wound rerolls if they are near Angron and maybe some 8 bound and going into a weakened enemy unit. So there are really some incredibly solid buffs from Angra on this edition. He isn't just a melee beat stick, he is a really really good force multiplier as well. He can turn himself and his allies around him from just simply terrifying powerhouses to mind-blowingly disgusting powerhouses in close combat. And then as mentioned his durability isn't bad but it's also a bit deceptive. He's a lot more durable than you may think because his other rule reborn in blood means that in your blessings of corn rolls if you roll three sixes on the eight dice you can use those three sixes to bring Angron back to the battlefield if he's been destroyed. So if he does get shot off the board turn one and you manage to roll three sixes on the next battle rounds uh, blessings dice he can potentially be put back into ongoing reserves and deep strike back in to bring carnage to your opponent's battle lines all over again and you can do that as long as you roll those three sixes. So yes sure rolling three sixes on eight dice isn't always going to happen but you can potentially get Angron back two or three times in a game. So it's a really really powerful rule and again means that your opponent will never feel 
fully safe from Angron, which is, if nothing else, a really good kind of psychological trick to play because they never know when Angron may just up and reappear right in the back of their battle lines. Finally, in this list in the fifth spot, there again were quite a few options that I could have taken. It is quite a good index in terms of the internal balance. Jackals are solid objective holders. Morlefiends are still super solid, super fast moving and heavy hitting beat sticks. But in the end, I just had to go for the big boy himself, the Corn Lord of Skulls. This night size monstrosity is just fantastic at the moment. He is pricey, he's 480 points, so it is a big, big investment. But I would say he is so good at the moment, I still think that potentially taking two along with Angron may be a really good starting point for a World Eaters army to build around. The Lord of Skulls is toughness 13. He's got a three up save and a five up invulnerable and a whopping 24 wounds. So he is really hard to put down. He has an OC value of eight, so he can also control and claim and steal objectives relatively well. And of course, he is just a massive, massive beat stick. And it's not just in melee either. He also has some solid shooting too. He's got a good choice of ranged weapons. The Gore Storm Cannon and the Gatling Cannon are his base guns, and they give you D6 plus three, strength 10, minus two AP, three damage shots, and then a further 12, strength eight, minus two, two damage shots from the Gatling Cannon with sustained hits. So we can put down range a lot of shooting that is great at killing Marines or lighter vehicles. Alternatively, he can swap out the Gatling Cannon for a Skull Hurler, which gives you some stronger strength 14 shots, again with a minus 3 AP and 3 damage, whilst his Gore Storm Cannon can instead be changed for the Demon Gore Cannon, which again is really good anti-tank, it's strength 14, minus 4 AP, D6 plus 2 damage, or if you need more anti-infantry, the Ica Cannon is 2 D6 shots at strength 7, minus 2 AP and 2 damage. Overall, although you can mix and match these to kind of fit your purposes, I think the Demon Gore and the Skull Hurler are solid if you are going after vehicles and tanks, whilst the base loadout of the Gore Storm Cannon and the Gatling Cannon are just really good all-rounders, and it is going to be worth keeping those, I think, if you aren't quite sure what you're going to be up against, but there's presumably going to be some Marines and some infantry, as well as some heavier elites and maybe light vehicles to take care of as well. That's probably going to serve you relatively well against most targets. In melee, of course, he gets even better. His Great Cleaver is even more terrifying. It's got a sweep profile that lets him do 15 attacks that hit on threes, and they are strength eight, minus two AP, two damage. So this will net you around five Marines dead in a single round of combat. Or the Strike profile, which is his anti-tank, anti-vehicle, which is an incredible strength 16, minus four AP, and flat eight damage. So similar to Angron, he's not quite as good, but he is still easily capable of taking out most vehicles. And against something like an Imperial Knight on the charge, he will do around 21 damage or so. So with a bit of shooting beforehand, or maybe a reroll from a command point, he can still definitely take out Questorius Knights in a single turn of combat. And then it isn't just his durability or damage output that makes the Lord of Skulls worth taking at the moment. His ability Blessed Slaughter is a really, really strong one too and makes him a really good utility unit. What this does is it lets you add or subtract one to a dice roll for your Blessings roll for each enemy unit this model has destroyed in the previous battle round. So if you have killed one unit in the previous battle round, you can modify one of those eight dice that you rolled. And this, it may not seem like much, but this is really, really strong. If you need a specific roll, say a double six for the advance and charge, you can change one of those fives that you may have into a six and get it off. Or if you have two sixes and a five and Angron is dead, well, there you go. You just got Angron back. And what I really like about this is that you can modify it down as well. It's just a really flexible rule that means as you kill more and more of the enemy, you are going to have much more control over what buffs you are going to be getting and when. And of course, arguably the most important, you have a much, much better chance of being able to res Angron. And I think that kind of bonus of it all by itself makes it worth bringing the Lord of Skulls for just to help out with that particular aspect. But just in general, the rule is really good and means you have much more reliability and assurance 
in knowing that the blessings you want and need for a particular turn you can more reliably get. He is just all round a brilliant, tanky, reasonably fast, killy unit that can also boost your entire army really well thanks to that Blessings of Corn dice manipulation. So I do think for 480 points, whilst that's not cheap, they are still well worth it. They're going to bring you so much damage output. They're going to be such a good, big, durable target that your opponent is going to need to get rid of. And they will just make your entire force perform just better. So that is it for the World Eaters. They have a limited index, it is fair to say, but they do have a lot of great units in it. Things like Exalted Eightbound, Jackals, Maul of Fiends, the generic Lord or Juggernaut, even Khan the Betrayer can all be very good additions to a competitive list, but this is just my top five. I think each of these units we've talked about today brings a lot to your list. It makes you in some capacity faster or tougher or killier, or just helps your army out in general in terms of those Blessings of Corn buffs. But as always, what do you think of this list and what are your top picks from the World Eaters Index? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Please do like and subscribe for more Warhammer content from me. But until next time, I'll catch you later, guys.